fell in love with Nepal as a 20 year old exchange student and I lived there for eight or nine months and just had the most incredible intense experiences from meeting monks to climbing mountains and just kind of fell in love with the people and the culture and just the variety of experiences I had there were unlike anything I had ever experienced before. One story I remember pretty, you know, pretty intensely about Nepal is just outside of the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, I decided to go on a hike to the Queen's Forest and I was just, I looked at the map and saw the Queen's Forest and thought it looked really interesting. And I hiked up there with, uh, with a friend and about three quarters of the way up we met a monk and he kind of befriended us and shared some of his food with us and we kind of walked up to the summit with him. You know, on the way down he was saying, oh, come visit us at, at the monastery, I live in Boda. We went there uh, a few days later. Again, he just spent the whole day with us at the monastery and showed us photos of his family and took us around uh, Bodana. And I kind of felt like from my culture, I was wondering like, what is he trying to get from me? Like, what is, he, what is he trying to get at? What does he want? Why is he being so nice? And I was always waiting for the, for the catch, but there never was one. He just was, you know, sharing his time and that was it. So we did a project for Bailpada Hospital, uh, which is in the Acham region of uh, far western Nepal. We got connected uh, to the hospital through, uh, through a friend who's the director of the hospital, and I was with him on a prior trip to Nepal um, through Engineers Without Borders. One of their problems is, is power requirements. They're trying to run uh, you know, a pretty advanced rural hospital um, in an area where they don't have a reliable grid. Um, they have power for about eight hours a day. I want to work on projects that affect Nepal directly because I have a lot of really good solid connections there um, which I think are pretty you know pretty integral uh, for working in another country. Uh, we already had an established relationship with Gam Power. Uh, they were the uh, Nepali solar contractors who installed this system on Bayalpada Hospital. So we already kind of had a working relationship there. I knew their project manager. Uh, and when it came to thinking about developing uh, a project uh, in Nepal, I you know, thought about contacting Gong Power um, to see what kind of projects they had in their, you know, in their queue for this year. Jordan wrote an email to me stating that he wants to have some kind of knowledge exchange program between Sunbridge Solar and Gong Power. Uh, what I did was I instantly wrote an email to him stating that we are very ready and very excited to work with you on this knowledge exchange program. During that time you had a lot of projects. So among them the project was the Balso drinking water project. Uh, we were working uh, in an area of Nepal called Kailali and that was uh, it's a project that they you know that they had in their pipeline something uh, that they had developed through a German NGO. I think I really enjoyed how open they were to working with us. The power situation in Kailali is that they have about 8 to 10 hours of grid power a day. The rest of the time there's, there's no grid power. Um, so without grid power they don't have access to clean water. Uh, the solar provided a backup um, you know, power source for their, for their water pump to provide that, you know, that clean water when the grid is down. They have, uh, you know, more demand for power than they have power to give uh, at this time. So load shedding is something that happens, you know, throughout Nepal, um, where during scheduled times the power is is cut off, and it's just something that people have become uh, accustomed to. I mean, 80 percent of people are Tharus. If you talk about the numbers of community in Nepal, there are uh, 115. 115 communities and ethnic groups, right? Among them, Tharu's community are supposed to be the most ancient, the most oldest community in Nepal. Tharu people are the owner of Nepal, but they've been ruled by other community and they work as slaves later on. So that's their history. As soon as government uh, announced their freedom, uh, about their freedom of slavery, what government did was 
each of the Tharu family is provided with uh, two katha, what is that called, I don't know, two kathas of land to them with one house, it's a small house, right? Unfortunately, water in the Tarai region is featured with a lot of arsenic and they are not filtered at all. But Tharu community, because they don't have enough money with them, they compulsorily they have to use that water, arsenic water, or water with arsenic. That's why a lot of Tharu communities start having a lot of diseases, a lot of cancers, a lot of throat problems, something like that. And uh, yeah, they have been using such arsenic, um, such water with arsenic and unfiltered water before that project. Um, so without grid power, they don't have access to clean water. Uh, the solar provided a backup, um, you know, power source for their for their water pump to provide that, you know, that clean water when the grid is down. The outcome of the knowledge exchange, I think, I think there were two main pieces. Uh, one of them uh, was this idea of having an exchange program where uh, one of the employees from Gom Power uh, come and stay with us here, so we can kind of show them what we do, um, and then. Kind of a follow-up for that is to send one installer for a few weeks over there to work with them and to get some real you know off-grid experience um, working over in nepal so i think that was one of the major uh, takeaways uh, the second was this idea of a nano grid project um, uh, which was something that really came from gom power and then we uh, started discussing with with them to help uh, develop this this concept Especially our plan is to, uh, I mean, minimize the kerosene fuels. Very poor people, right? Very poor people, poor houses are using 25 liters of kerosene only for lighting per month. A nanogrid is sort of a very small example of a grid. So in the United States, we have the grid, very reliable. Um, there's such thing as a microgrid, uh, where in, let's say, a rural community, you have multiple sources of renewable energy, perhaps you have a hydropower system and it powers, you know, a few thousand homes. Um, that's kind of a microgrid. A nanogrid concept is an even smaller take of that. Um, the idea is to have one solar panel uh, power about 20 homes um, with two batteries. The outcome of this partnership will be Sunbeach Solar will be helping Gam Power in nanogrid projects uh, in rural Nepal. Sunbeach Solar has his, uh, I mean, their own projects, and they will do at least hundred projects within this year. And if they do hundred projects in a year, right, they will send hundred times, uh, I mean, hundred times hundred, ten thousand dollar to that fund. You a little bit, huh? So we will do that project. We will use that fund as a grant for nanogrid projects. Nanogrid models are very, I mean, uh, nanogrid models are, seems to be very, I mean, feasible in both rural and urban Nepal. I feel the biggest accomplishment in Nepal was to make connection with this company, uh, Gom Power, over there. I think that's going to be a relationship that lasts for a long time. You need to have well-established um, responsible partners um, and I think we have that there with Gom Power uh, with the Rotary Club um, we have those you know those partners and also just you know I, I keep on being drawn towards coming back to Nepal as my fifth time over um, so just you know with that passion for the country coupled with the connections we have I think it's a great place for us to work My first thoughts after hearing the news about the earthquake were about the people that we, we know there. Um, you know, just thinking about Gom Power um, in their office and uh, Kishore and Jivan, people that we had worked with while we were out there, you know, wondering if they were okay. And, you know, luckily we were able to find out quickly on Facebook that they were all okay and that their family and friends were okay as well. So after the earthquake, like, um there are several uh, buildings in Kathmandu that has broken down and in the villages like many villages have just been swept away and uh, so after the earthquake like there are several 
um, cracks in the in the hills and then now it's like monsoon season in Nepal and everyone is like in the fear that more landslides would happen this year and like more villages would be swept away by landslides. Uh, I went to my Rotary Club and they looked to me there as the Nepal guy so they were asking questions they want to know you know they wanted to know what was going on if everyone um, you know, that we had contact with, with the Dooley Kell Rotary Club were, were safe and if the project, um, the solar project at a hospital that we'd worked on in the past was, was undamaged. Um, so they were all concerned. Uh, the condition of the solar water pumping project that we worked on um, was okay. The status, you know, that we received from Jeevan was that it was undamaged. Um, the building was still standing. Uh, the infrastructure was there, and there was no there was no issue with it. Luckily, it was far enough from the epicenter uh, that they didn't really receive uh, very strong, damaging quakes in that region. Like now, people are thinking of building more like hospital proof house, and then they have realized they need some open space within their neighborhood for emergency reasons. The collaboration with GOM Power has changed in that our priorities have shifted a little bit. Um, prior to the earthquake, we were thinking about working with them on a nanogrid solar project and now our priorities have more shifted to kind of the immediate relief work um, and rebuilding. We can also start with uh, like a small investment in some villages to work as a pilot project and to prove that this model works to rebuild because the the rebuilding process would go for like i think uh, from five to ten years there are lots of things to rebuild <laughs>